Hello again. Here we are on part two of our little lecture series on resource management. And so to what we're going to be looking at in this segment is the other side of the spectrum. So the first side from the first, I guess, part one was all about Gifford Pinchot, uh, who was into conservation and uh, really saw resources as a commodity. And so how do you manage the, the resources and maximize your yields? John Muir, on the other hand, was on the other side of the spectrum. And so we're going to keep the Cornell thing going, and you can hit pause if you want to, but here's the line, here's uh, some stuff I typed out just for you guys to kind of keep track of John Muir. Uh, he, he had a really interesting life, and so I want to just tell you a little background story uh, about him. And so the story goes, he was born in Scotland, and with his family they migrated to the, to the United States, and they, they landed in the East Coast. Uh, like lots of Europeans did. And so they left Scotland, uh, and they weren't farmers in Scotland, but they came to the, to the U.S. because they heard you could get free land to uh, start farming. And so that's what they were going for. And so they headed west, like everybody else did, open frontier, and they got themselves to Wisconsin, and they made, they made a common mistake that a lot of uh, people that wanted to be farmers but didn't know how made. They saw all the trees growing in Wisconsin, and Wisconsin is a really a beautiful state, lots of forest. But they saw those trees and they thought, well, if trees grow this well, you know, corn and wheat must grow even better. And so they ended up spending, uh, you know, backbreaking work trying to uh, remove all these root systems of trees to, to like kind of create their fields that they could farm. So little did they know they could have gone just a little bit further to like southern Minnesota or Iowa, Nebraska, like the prairie was, is much more suitable for farming. Uh, and so actually there's a lot of recovering farm, farms, abandoned farms in Wisconsin, which is another story. It makes great deer habitat, which can cause problems actually. But at any rate, so he grew up on a farm uh, and was not, you know, it was not in his destiny to like do what he did as like the father of preservation. He, he, re he was really into inventing things. He was all over in like nature and stuff and like checking out birds. And I've read some books about him. That, that, uh, so he, he was definitely, you know, kind of tuned in with the land just because that's where, he, you know, that's all there was. Uh, but he was really into like engineering and so he'd do these little projects um, and the story goes is that he he'd designed this little contraption and he entered it into a, a, a science fair and somebody from the University of Wisconsin was there and saw his little invention and was so impressed that they basically strong-armed him into going to the University of Wisconsin and so that's what he did uh, and so John Muir and I have that in common because I also went there and I uh, could feel the John Muir vibes uh, and actually when I was there uh, I saw one of his inventions and so I've got a picture of it here super cool uh, so this is one of John Muir's things that he designed and so apparently his father was super strict and they super religious too so for the longest time all he was allowed to have was a Bible uh, so hard living on the farm, but eventually he started to study, uh, and he built this thing, and it was so he could maximize his study time. And so basically, what this thing is, all it's all entirely out of wood, and these are wooden gears. And he set up his books here, and up, up here somehow it's like a sundial, and this thing would react to the sun. And uh, when the sun was in a certain position in the sky, the whole contraption would shift his next book. So he'd go from I don't know biology to math to to whatever, uh, all based on this contraption kind of crazy. I've seen it with my own two eyes. Uh, so anyway, the story continues. So he got done with Wisconsin, degree in engineering, and he went to work at a manufacturing plant. And he, he rose up the ranks. He was the crew boss or the, the foreman uh, until one day there was an accident at the, on, on the floor in the, in the factory and there was a small explosion. And John Muir was involved and he was hospitalized for uh, like a month. And his head was bandaged and there was a really good chance he'd never be able to see again. And so it's one of those classic stories while he was bandaged and he was just sitting in the dark for an entire month. But while he was in the dark, he saw the light and he like, you know, questioned his, his existence and those kinds of things. And when they finally took the bandages off and he could actually see again, uh, he basically quit his job at the, at the, the, the plant and had like a Forrest Gump moment and he started to walk and he walked and he walked and he tried to walk all the way to Mexico from Wisconsin which is too far to walk uh, he found out and he had got sick and malaria all this stuff on the way but he just kept on going uh, and eventually he ended up in Yosemite and I've got a picture of Yosemite here if you haven't been to Yosemite shh, you gotta go it's like there's no place in the world quite like it and it's just four hours away uh, but so he lived here before it was a national park and the, the, the folklore goes that he, he was so into nature at this point it'd be like a rain you know lightning storm and he'd go out and he'd climb the tallest tree he could find just to uh, 
be a little closer to uh, to nature. And so uh, he was there for a while, and then one of his big things that he did was he saw Yosemite, and he he knew people were you know coming through and logging and things like that, and he's like, not this place. And so he convinced Theodore Roosevelt, who incidentally was working with Gifford Pinchot at the same time. So this is all happening in the same little time period. He got uh, Roosevelt to come out and they rode on horseback. Uh, and apparently Roosevelt was a big hunter too. So he was an outdoors kind of guy. And so I believe this is at the top of, uh, actually, I don't, oh, that's Yosemite Falls in the background there. So this must be on the other side. Uh, but anyway, so he convinced Roosevelt to set this area aside to be preserved, not conserved, preserved. That means we're not going to touch it. And so what uh, Muir believed was that these resources have intrinsic value. It's not just a monetary value. They have a, you know, just existing is enough. And that some of these resources need to be preserved and some entire areas need to stay wild. Uh, some people call national parks the single best idea the United States has ever had, making national parks. In other countries, they, they don't have them, right? Uh, so anyway, so that was, so Muir did that, and he got Roosevelt on board, and he, they also did the Grand Canyon and other parks as well. And so, again, the difference between Muir and Pinchot is Muir didn't want to use the resources. We're going to set them aside. We're going to, like, just put them over there. But interestingly, uh, if you go to Yosemite or any national park, uh, the, the only thing you can do there is recreation, you know, biking and hiking and, you know, that kind of stuff, camping. But if you go to Yosemite, uh, they, they have so many people coming through that they've, I mean, there's a huge impact. You know, there's traces of smog, they've got big traffic problems, including traffic jams and garbage. And uh, so that, that recreation leaves an impact too. So I've been to a national forest where it's like, you know, there's logging and things going on, but there's, there's just way less people. And so maybe there's a lower impact, even though they're, they're using different resources. And so it's an interesting uh, just kind of way to look at things. And so the last slide I'm going to leave you with here is uh, this one here. Uh, if you haven't been to Muir Woods, it's about a half hour from San Francisco on, on the Marin side. And so this was just like another salute to John Muir. And there's a John Muir trail in the Sierras. But you got to go here. Look at how big these redwoods are. Just so close to San Francisco. Uh, it's like it, it is a, a, a spiritual world in there. And this is the place they spill. If you've seen Return of the Jedi, this is the last scene where they do the Ewoks with those furry creatures chasing each other around the forest. Um, it was filmed here in Muir Woods. Uh, Skywalker Ranch is not too far from there with uh, George Lucas and all that. All right, so we're going to go ahead and sign off. Uh, I hope you found that interesting. Uh, what I would highly encourage you to do is go back and there's a little, it says summary there. I don't know if it's gotten cut off, but uh, summarize the entire thing of uh, the, the, the Cornell notes there and then go through and put little questions here in the margin. Hope you found that interesting. We'll see you next time. Thanks.